Well, good morning. It's always good to be back and to see familiar faces. Um, I'd like to begin our time this morning by reading from Luke chapter 11. So if you have your Bibles, it doesn't look like, oh, there it is. Or you can follow along on the screen as well. So let's take a look at Luke chapter 11. And we'll start reading verse 1. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation. And he said to them, which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer him, do not bother me, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And so we begin our passage this morning with uh, a question. And that is a question the disciples bring to Jesus as we begin. And that question is, teach us to pray. How do we pray? And here we see that uh, Jesus has just been in prayer. His disciples have seen him go off in prayer. And they want to be taught the way that John has taught his disciples. And so... They come and they ask him, Lord, teach us to pray. And I think there are two major sections that Jesus responds with. Um, and the first, in, in verses 2 to 4, is what we usually call the Lord's Prayer, right? And the main point of that section of what he's teaching is guidance on the language of prayer. The things that we are to pray about, the priorities that we are to organize. And so this is some of the best known content in the Bible. Within a couple decades ago, in schools across North America, children would say this prayer in the morning. Things have changed. Uh, in the Lord's Prayer, it's not magic words. It's not some formula that we need to uh, repeat. Um, although I think it is helpful that we do uh, use these words to pray sometimes. It helps us to formulate our thoughts in the way that we approach God. Uh, but the point is, they serve as a guide to kind of show us what are the kind of things that we are to pray and how do we organize the way that we pray. But the second of these sections, and that's the majority of our passage, uh, is verses 5 to 13. And here Jesus shares a parable. And he uses that to illustrate and to set up our posture of prayer. How we approach God, how we understand the relationship of what it means to come before God and to ask him in prayer. And so this is where I want to focus our time this morning. Uh, what direction does Jesus have to offer his disciples on how we should pray? We have a saying in our culture, and that is the squeaky wheel gets the grease. And what that means is if you want something, you got to speak up. You've got to advocate for yourself. If you're looking for a raise, a promotion, if you're advocating for a cause or campaigning, if you want something, you've got to say it. Petition for it. Uh, just literally within the past week, I was out on my bike riding through Vancouver, trying to enjoy that window between the rain and the smoky season. Um, and I passed a billboard, and on that billboard was a, an ad for Remax. And what the slogan that was on that billboard said was, don't wish for answers, ask for them. I'm not 100% sure what that means in a real estate context. I have many questions about Vancouver real estate. I don't know if I'm going to like the answers. Uh, but anyways, we see here that Jesus opens with a parable, as he so often does, and that illustrates pretty much exactly that point. 
So in this parable, verses 5 to 8, we see this this man goes to his neighbor uh, and he asks for bread. His friend has arrived on a journey and he has no food to give him. Clearly, he's not the most prepared guy around. And what the neighbor says to him essentially is, get lost. I'm in bed. My whole family's in bed. It is way too late to deal with this. And this is not important enough for you to come to me now and ask me for this. But what do we see? We see that this, the neighbor still drags himself out of bed and gives them what he wants. Why? Because that's the easiest solution to get rid of him. Jesus says in verse 8, I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And that word, uh, impudence, if you look in other translations like the NIV, uh, I think it's translated shameless audacity, which is such a great description. Uh, the scholar William Mounts, who's a, a Greek scholar, um, offers this translation of the Greek, which I think is amusingly blunt as well. And he describes it as persistence without regard to time, place, or person. You know, we've all known people like this. We know people with shameless audacity. People who are more than comfortable uh, letting you know their thoughts, their requests, their opinions. Uh, Just a couple of weeks ago, I was at Camp One at Anvil, and I was serving in the kitchen. Uh, First time ever. It was an interesting experience. But part of your responsibilities in the kitchen is that you're part of the serving line. You're giving out food to the kids. And um, if you want to experience shameless audacity, if you ask 50 teenage boys, how many pancakes do you want for breakfast? You'll experience shameless audacity. Or you're handing out identical sandwiches and someone points at another one and says, actually, I want that one. You're like, they're all the same. Uh, Yeah, if you want to experience shameless audacity, uh, let me put in a plug for Anvil. Go work in the kitchen. Talk to Jordan. They'd love to have you. Uh, And in the parable, Jesus says, because of this man's impudence, his shameless audacity, he will receive what he asks for. And at first, that might seem to us like a bit of a strange moral, right? Like, what, what really is Jesus telling us here? Is he telling us to be obnoxious? Is he telling us that we just got to go and bug him, harass him? Uh, and so the, the first thing we got to understand is important we realize this is a parable, right? So the way that a parable works is that it illustrates a point in kind of a striking, attention-grabbing, vivid way. Sometimes they're even funny. Um, So we don't hold up every character in a parable as an example for us to follow, right? Uh, Think of the parable of the uh, secretary who tears up all his master's contracts and rewrites them behind his back, right? It's not a moral exemplar for us to follow. But a parable is a colorful way to illustrate a point. So what is the point? And again, I believe it is not that we are to harass God into answering our prayers. Uh, I think it's very clear as we look at the rest of this passage that it's not what it is saying. But Jesus is vividly trying to make a point, and that is we are to ask. The first step in approaching God in prayer is to come and to ask. And I realize that could sound painfully obvious, right? And in one respect, it is incredibly uh, simple. But sometimes it is the simplest things that we overlook. You know, now and then, um, I like to play tennis. It's not very often, maybe once or twice a year. And usually when I play tennis, this is how it goes down. The first game, I'm swinging my racket, and I'm just, like, pounding homers out of the park. Or I'm hitting it, and it's going flying off to the side, and it's just nothing is going right. So I get frustrated, and I'm like, why is this happening? And the thing is that tennis actually requires some technique, right? The way that you stand, the way that you approach the ball matters. The way that you hold your racket matters, right? So if you miss that that first basic fundamental technique, those first steps, everything, all your effort is wasted. And likewise, I believe in prayer, we can neglect that first step. James, uh, in the book of James 4.2, has this to say. He says, you desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. That's such a simple, essential, basic reminder, but sometimes we need that, don't we? You know, I was thinking of the words of that 
the famous uh, familiar hymn by Joseph Scrivens. He says, Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. And so Jesus' words in verse 9 of our chapter, he says, And I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. And we see what we have here is an invitation. It is not a, Jesus isn't laying an obligation. He's not laying a chore. It is an invitation. And I think that should formulate our entire posture of prayer. You know, we have the door open to go to the God, the sovereign God of the universe who created through the power of his word. And sometimes we feel like that's a chore. And God is not, he's not the grouchy boss that you don't want to go and bother because you're not sure how he's going to lash out. He's not the distant supervisor who's just too far away for you to access. We don't need to book an appointment. We don't need to plead our case to be heard. Jesus reveals him as the father whose door is always open to his children. And I tell you, ask, and it will be given you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be open to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Our relationship to God through prayer is opened by our willingness to come forward, to accept this invitation, and to ask. And now I realize the huge question that so often follows that. And that question is simply, why is it that sometimes I pray and I ask for things and I don't get what I ask for? You know, anybody who has practiced prayer, anybody from the newest Christian to the most mature Christian, I think has experienced this. Maybe at times wrestled with it. So people start to ask questions, am I doing it wrong? Right, is God not listening to me? Does he not care? Am I not trying hard enough? So how do we recognize this invitation that we have in this passage with the reality that sometimes our prayers are not answered? And I think that Jesus points to the answer right here in our passage. So let's take a look again at verses 11 to 12. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? And notice, pay careful attention to the language that he uses here. Because if you look closely, you see that what Jesus is asserting is in fact not that whatever the son asks is necessarily the exact thing that he is going to be given. Right? He doesn't say that if the son asks for fish, that he's guaranteed to receive a fish. What does he actually say? He says, if a son asks for a fish, he will not receive a serpent. Or if he asks for an egg, he won't give a scorpion. So what is this all about? What is Jesus actually saying here? And I think that Jesus makes it clear that God promises to hear, to respond, and yes, to answer our prayers. And he will never res- respond to a request with an evil thing. But the promise is not that we will always receive exactly what we ask for. And if we're honest, at first, when we hear that, it might sound like a little bit of a cop-out, right? We're given this, this invitation to come boldly and to ask. And we're told if we ask that we will receive. You know, it almost feels like maybe Jesus inflates this big, huge promise of prayer, and then he kind of deflates it a little bit. Like he gives a promise, and there's kind of this fine print in the bottom. You know, when you see an offer for an ad or a product, and it looks great, and you're like, this is too good to be true. And then you look into it, and there's all the, the fine print, you know, the terms and conditions, the strings attached. You know, I was just um, reading an article recently about timeshares. And they were saying, you know, timeshares, they seem like this great offer, right? Like you have a, all the luxury of owning a vacation home and not having to worry about maintenance when you're not there. Um, or you get these points, and you can exchange them with other locations so you can, you know, vacation somewhere else. <laughs> So the salespeople for timeshares, they talk up this very attractive package. Uh, But it turns out just because you can trade weeks at another place doesn't mean they're actually available or affordable for you to do that. Um, The fees that you pay, they can all of a sudden, they can go up without warning. 
Uh, and it turns out once you sign up, you, your children, their children, your whole family line to the thousandth generation is locked into this contract that you cannot escape. So there are companies that exist solely to get you out of a timeshare. So we might ask, does this invitation to come boldly in prayer, does it come with fine print? Is it an offer that sounds good, but is watered down by the terms and conditions? And I think the answer comes down to this. The promise of God, the guarantee, is not that we will always receive exactly what we were asking for. Rather, when we ask, God's promise is that he will provide what is good for us, even when that differs or conflicts with our desires. The promise is not that we always get what we ask for, but that God will provide what is good for us. And the truth is that can be a difficult and a disappointing thing to swallow. Yet the truth is what we think that we want, what we think that we even need maybe, is not always the case. Sometimes when we look back in our life, we can see how the thing that we wanted, the thing that looked so good to us, the thing we wanted so badly, how harmful it could have been to us. There's a, a fable, famous fable, that illustrates that point. The fable of King Midas, right? He's this Greek, ancient Greek king. He's offered a gift from the gods. You can have one gift, you can have one ability, whatever you want, we'll give it to you. So he says, I want the ability that everything I touch turns to gold. So he goes out in his garden and he starts touching the roses and they turn to gold in his hands. And he is ecstatic. He's like, I am going to be the richest man who ever lived. And so he's over the moon until he goes and it's time for dinner and he sits down to eat. And he goes out to reach for some food and it turns to gold. And everything that he touches with his hands, everything he touches with his lips, turns to gold, and he realized what he has done is he's condemned himself to starve. Sometimes the things that look great to us turn out to be disastrous. They may do us harm. They may get in the way of what is actually better for us. Maybe they close the door on something that would have been so much better. C.S. Lewis once commented, he said, if God had granted all the silly prayers I've made in my life, where should I be now? And so God does not uh, teach us to approach prayer like a divine vending machine, right? You go to the vending machine, you're like, I want my bag of cheese puffs, whatever, right? You put your dollar fifty in. It's probably not enough anymore. I haven't used a vending machine in a long time. But point is, prayer is not like an economic transaction, right? It's not a formula of give and get. You know, as much as sometimes we'd like that, right? I think that Jesus is actually pointing us to something that is so much richer than that, so much deeper than that in these, in these verses. And I think that we see the key to this uh, is revealed in how Jesus transitions his language over the course of these verses, right? So in the parable, Jesus talks about the friends, the acquaintance. Well, when he gets to verse 11 and he's talking about God, it goes from friends to father. Tim Keller observes, Jesus did not teach us to pray our friend who is in heaven, but to our father. And you know, the dynamic of that parental relationship is different, right? The friend does not carry the responsibilities of a parent to, to discipline, to provide for needs rather than wants, right? The friend is there when you're doing something stupid, your friend is there to cheer you on on the sidelines. or at least if you have friends like I did. Obviously, a good friend will act out of motivations for your best interests, but the parent has the unique responsibility to provide. To pro provide, to give with your best interests, with your well-being in mind, and to say the hard no's when that needs to be said. No diligent, no good parent gives their child everything they ask for. Otherwise, every two-year-old diet would consist of sugar and Cheerios, right? You think you see the parents with their little kid, you know, going through the aisles of the supermarket, and the kids are reaching out, oh, I want that. And the parent has to come in and say, no, like, this is not what we need. As a kid, if I had my way, my bedtime would have been never. No good parent gives the child their every demand and their every request. 
Because you can be a bad parent by neglecting your, parent, your children's needs, by ignoring them, by not listening to them. You can also be a bad parent by giving them everything they're asking for. A loving parent responds to requests by giving what is necessary and what is beneficial. And of course, for a lot of parents, that's often, that's a challenging thing to know, right? I mean, how do you, how do you discipline a child who's acting out? Or how do you find that balance between, you know, pushing them to go out, to do things, to be diligent, to work hard, but also giving them space to relax? Uh, do you force your kid to go and to practice piano, or are they going to come to you in 20 years and say, why didn't you make me, like, stick to this? There are many challenging choices for a parent, and no, per- no human parent, even a loving one, always has the right answer. Yet God, on the other hand, knows exactly what we need and how to deal with our circumstances. In verse 13, Jesus emphasizes, If you then, who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give? And you know, when Jesus says, you who are evil, he doesn't mean that every parent is a terrible parent, right? His whole point is that that parents naturally want to give their children good things. Well, what he means is that even the best intentions, the most diligent parent, still deals with the reality of sin, with their own limitations, that leads them to fall short sometimes, right? To make the wrong decisions. But when we trust God, we trust a God who knows fully what we need and who cares deeply for us. In Matthew 10, uh, 29 to verse 10, verses 29 to 31, Jesus says, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. And so it is the character and the promise of the father to provide what is truly best for the needs of the child, even when the child does not see or understand this. Because, I mean, so often a child doesn't realize that a parent is acting in their best interests. I mean... When a a child picks up a pair of scissors and the parent comes in and takes that away. Or they're playing out on the street and they get too close to the road and the parent comes and scoops them up and takes them away. Right from the the child's perspective, the parent is just being a buzzkill. They're just there to ruin their fun, not letting them have what they want. The child lacks perspective. They don't comprehend what is dangerous. The parent focuses on the need of the child over the desire. And so when we enter into prayer to God as Father, that is how he responds to us. And so the foundation of our approach to God in prayer is trust. Trust that God has a God's eye view of our lives, of our circumstances. And trust that when we submit our needs to God, he responds as our Heavenly Father. So that is the essence of what the Bible talks about when it talks about childlike faith, right? Some, for some people, they hear childlike faith and they think that means being naive, having blind faith, right? But that is not what childlike faith is like. I mean, think of a child. Young children are some of the most timid and most cautious people around. Most children, it seems like they go through some kind of shy phase where sometimes just seeing a stranger is enough to make them cry. Trust me, nothing will take you down a peg in life like making a child cry just at the sight of your face. When a child is in unfamiliar, strange, overwhelming circumstances, where do they go? When they're in a room full of strangers, or when there's a thunderstorm, and there's this loud noise, where do they go? They run and they cling to the parents. Why? Because if they have good parents, they have learned from experience that in these uncertain circumstances, they can trust them, right? They're not going to go to a stranger. They're not going to go to somebody that they haven't learned to trust. Childlike faith is not naivety. We are not called to naive faith. Rather, it is the opposite. Childlike faith is putting your faith in somebody you trust in times of uncertainty and confusion because they 
have proven themselves trustworthy. So do we trust God is good? If we do, we will trust that he will not give us every single thing that we ask for. That every desire that we come to him with will simply just be granted to us. So what do we do with all this? We come back to this original question that the disciples bring to Jesus. How do we pray? How do we live out Jesus' teaching here? First off, we should be reminded that we are invited to ask. There are no answers without asking. No journey begins without that first step. We begin by asking. And think back to that, that image, that language of that audacious, that persistent asker. We are to pray boldly, persistently, and candidly. God never turns away. He never ignores us. He never despises us for coming to him with our needs. When we seek, we find. When we knock, he opens. God opens doors, changes hearts, and provides for needs when we ask. And you know, sometimes we get what we want. Sometimes what we are asking for is aligned with God's will, with what is good for us, and he gives to us that thing that we ask for. Yet we also realize that in asking, we are turning over our desires to the discernment of the Father. There are times, I think, when we want to read this passage as ask for a fish, get a fish. And you know, for a hungry child, asking for a fish is not a bad thing. There are times when we pray for a good thing and it doesn't work out. A relief from an illness, from pain. And you know, these are some of the most difficult things, right? And the, I realize it's easy to stand up here and to sound trite, like, you know, distrust. And that's the last thing that I want to do. I don't want to wave away or trivialize the hardship of an ungranted request or pretend to have all the answers to it. But I do want to point to the promises of Jesus here in this passage himself. That God's care and wisdom concerning the needs of his children exceeds the capacity of any earthly parent. Do you know when God acts, he sees and he responds with perspective that we don't have. We ask with immediacy in mind. God responds with eternity in mind. And so, thirdly, I think there is a call for us to surrender in prayer. That when we come before God with our requests, we are willing to hear and to listen when God responds. You know, we're not just submitting a request for a simple yes or no, right? Rubber stamp, approved not approved, but to be willing and prepared to have our hearts and desires shaped by God as we bring them to him. You know, the Apostle Paul uh, in 2 Corinthians talks about something he experienced where he calls the, a thorn in the flesh, some kind of affliction that caused him hardship, and we don't know exactly what that was, right? Some people speculate his eyesight wasn't very good. Maybe it was something medical. Others think it was more likely that it was some kind of opponent, whether it's a spiritual thing or whatever it was. In some ways, maybe it's better that we don't know because we can apply this to so many different circumstances. But here's what Paul says about his experience about a thorn in the flesh. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest on me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And so we see that Paul's desire, his request, was to gain relief from his weakness. And we see God doesn't grant that. But he doesn't leave the prayer unanswered. Rather, God reveals to Paul a deeper knowledge of his grace, an experience of his power and his provision. And so instead of removal of this thorn, Paul going to God 
his asking, his wrestling with God in prayer, became the opportunity for God to reveal something to him that he would never have experienced if he got his own way. Uh, Richard Foster, he's a famous Christian author who writes about spiritual disciplines, uh, talks about something called the prayer of relinquishment in his book, appropriately, appropriately entitled Prayer. And he says, the prayer of relinquishment is a bona fide letting go, but it is a release with hope. We have no fatalist resignation. We are buoyed up by confidence in the trust in the character of God. A release with hope. Built on the character of a God who has revealed himself as our Father in heaven. And so praying in surrender may mean giving up uh, desires, areas that we would rather just leave outside of our prayer life. You know, we may have a sneaking suspicion that if we pray to God about this, that he's going to challenge those, that we may not want to offer those up. And it could be anything. It could be something to do with our career circumstances, our family, marriage, finances. To accept Jesus' invitation to ask is to bring ourselves, to open ourselves, surrender ourselves, to be shaped by God. And if needed, to be challenged in our understanding of what is good, what is healthy, and what brings glory to God and his kingdom. And so we, you see that prayer is more than a transaction. It is a transformation. So that's why prayer is never one and done, right? That's why we pray without ceasing. It's not because God forgets about us if we don't keep bringing it to him, right? It's not like he puts us at the back of the pile if we don't just remind him day after day. Praying without ceasing is not mindless repetition. It's not just saying the same thing over and over again. It is a process of responding to God as he gradually reveals his will to us. As he changes our hearts, as he opens doors, as he closes doors. As we are convicted by the need to reshape the things that we are asking for, to reshape our desires. So, we are called to surrender when necessary, but that surrender is always accompanied by a promise. What Jesus is saying to us here in chapter 11, and that is, first off, that when we ask, God does not respond in neglect or cruelty. He will not give us a serpent when we ask for a fish. But also that prayer is never fruitless. No prayer ever goes unheard or truly unanswered. So when we ask, we will receive. And maybe it's not going to be what we originally wanted. But we come to trust more and more that it is what God has intended for us and that is what we needed. So lastly, I just want to close by picking up one thing that is unique uh, to Luke's gospel here. And so if we look at verse 13, Jesus concludes by saying, If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And actually, if you compare this teaching to where it appears in the Gospel of Matthew in Matthew 7, uh, there Jesus is quoted as promising, how much more will your Father who is he in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Uh, but here in Luke, um, and Luke is the, the gospel that is focused on the Holy Spirit. He chooses to highlight a specific aspect of Jesus' promise, and that is the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so it is not something that conflicts with what is being said in Matthew, but it is Luke kind of honing in, telescoping in on this one core aspect of this promise. So why does Luke highlight the gift of the Holy Spirit? Reality is this could be a whole other sermon, and we really don't have time for this right now. You don't want to hear it. But let me, uh, with regards to our topic this morning, let me just draw in our attention to one core thing. And that is that in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit is called our advocate, our helper. And one way that he helps us is in our very prayers themselves. Paul has this to say in Romans 8.26. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray, for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes with us with groanings too deep for words. 
And so we see here a couple things. See, first off, that when we step into prayer, we are never praying alone. That when we take up this invitation to ask, the Holy Spirit comes alongside us and he works alongside us. And when our desires need to be changed, when they are warped, when they need to be transformed, when our perspective is too small, our view is too narrow, when the way that we are praying, when our motivations need to be transformed, the Holy Spirit takes up that request to teach us how to pray. To open our eyes, to change our hearts, to change our minds. And when we lack the language to pray, the Holy Spirit does not. You know, when we're not sure what we should be praying for, when we are uncertain about God's will, when we're confused about what is the right thing, this passage says the Holy Spirit himself intercedes for us. So with these things in mind, uh, I'd like to just close our time in prayer. Father, we approach you now in prayer uh, to accept this invitation to come before you, Lord. And there are so many things, um, so many questions that we have still about prayer. Lord, I just pray you would help us to trust you, to be willing to step into your hands when we come before you with our desires, to realize there are things that may need to change in the way that we look at the world, the way that we look at our lives. Father, help us to know uh, the depth of your love for us. Um, and we just ask that you would work in our lives for our good, for the glory of your kingdom. So, Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit that is with us now. Uh, we just pray these things in the great name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for those words that reminded us to have